Hurricane Beulah was my first one. It slammed into the Texas coast back in 1967, before I came to CBS. It left one-sixth of my home state underwater. Harvey would be even worse. But as I watched what Harvey wrought, I was struck by just how similar those pictures were to my memories of Beulah 50 years ago. Our technology is so good now, we knew exactly when Harvey would make landfall and a lot more. But it's not the technology we remember. It's realizing the awesome power of nature. This was Beulah. This is Harvey. Somehow the big ones always turn out worse than we thought. This is me, one day into Katrina. We knew it was bad. Tonight we are beginning to understand just how bad. In a hurricane, it's all hands on deck, whatever your job. Reporter Brandy Smith of our Houston affiliate, KHOU, was doing a live report when she saw a man trapped in a flooded truck. She flagged down a rescue boat team and led them to him. I am terrified for him, and here he comes. As she was reporting, her station was being evacuated because of high water. But it's always the most vulnerable who suffer the most. These kids got through Beulah. These will make it through Harvey. The pictures of traffic jams of Texans who didn't wait to be asked for help made me proud. They just loaded their boats on trailers and headed into the worst of it. Nor will I soon forget the pictures of these poor people in a retirement home. We can be thankful they were found. As it always is, we saw the worst bring out our best. After the awful scenes we saw just weeks ago in Charlottesville, in Texas, we saw white kids and black kids just being kids. In a hurricane, it doesn't matter if you are black or white or brown or purple. Maybe we do have to be taught to hate. The statistics this storm has generated are staggering. More important are the numbers we'll never really know all those who just showed up to help. Like Mattress Mac, the furniture dealer, who opened his showroom as a shelter to hundreds. Singers who sang. Oh, my soul. Barbers who showed up at shelters with their clippers. People forming human chains to rescue others from the flood. Go, 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 go. Bakers who baked. And the pizza guy who would not be deterred. And yes, that is Spider-Man. Only Texans would know all this unfolded on and around the very battlefield where Sam Houston and his ragtag army against all odds fought for and won Texas independence from Mexico. This week, their descendants met another powerful force. It's not over yet, but my money is on Texas. For Face the Nation, this is Bob Sheehan. From WBRN Radio in Boston and on the Boston Red Network. The Monday Morning Quarterback on the 4th of September 2017. And it is also Labor Day. Happy Labor Day to many uh, that are enjoying the supposed last great holiday of the summer of 2017. We start off with uh, some events that would normally captivate you I suppose is the word uh, in the 60s uh, those of us that were around for the so called Cuban uh, missile crises that the US itself had brought upon by the uh, idea of some right wing elements at that time of invading Cuba it didn't happen the uh, Soviet Union at the time sent missiles to uh, Cuba and a settlement was worked out that the uh, U.S. would withdraw some of its uh, weapons uh, from uh, Germany. And the Soviets uh, took their missiles uh, back uh, to the uh, Soviet Union. Uh, But one thing to remember, at that time, uh, it was the administration of John F. Kennedy, was a different time, in that uh, the uh, leadership, uh, President Kennedy and the people around him, were intellectually equipped to deal with that particular matter. In 2017, we have an administration that is 
totally divorced of any type of intellectual ability at all, period. And they are faced with a different kind of military establishment. And President Kennedy, of course, himself being a veteran of the Great uh, Patriotic War, had served in the Navy. And many of the uh, men around him also were uh, veterans of that war and came out of that tradition. And they understood war. They were around for Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the atom bombs that were dropped at that time. And later, in the early 50s, the H-bomb, hydrogen bomb, was developed. And that is where the Koreans are today. Now, the number of nations have the quote-unquote H. Uh, Britain, France, China, the Russian Federation, and of course the U.S. But this is a 50s uh, program there, and it's obviously been enhanced uh, since the 50s. That was during a period of time that the uh, Korean War had just ended which is technically still going on. So this is the crisis. The uh, military uh, person uh, there, the Secretary of Defense, Mad Dog Mathis, that says it all, is talking about a, a complete obliteration of the People's Democratic Republic of Korea. Does the U.S. have the wherewithal to do that? The answer there is is yes. They have the uh, strategic bombers. They have missiles that uh, could do that. But the problem is the weaponry that the People's Democratic Republic of Korea possess thousands, hundreds of thousands of pieces of artillery various uh, types of missiles that they do not really know what they do and don't have there. The close proximity of a soul from uh, the capital of the uh, Korean Republic uh, and of Japan. Now, would those places be targeted? Yes. And what event, and we haven't heard anything about this, of quote-unquote a surprise attack. One of the things that the uh, Korean Republic would want to know would the uh, Trump administration inform them of an attack? And probably not. But the uh, rocket forces of China and of the Russian Federation wouldn't know about it within a minute or so uh, that the attack was ongoing. And I would sell you swamp land in Florida if not, the Koreans would know about it also. So, in other words, a very, very dangerous situation. What are the probabilities? Well, we can go to the low probabilities of, say, a 5% uh, situation if there's a total bombing uh, or an attempt to kill the leadership or take out the various uh, missile sites in the uh, Korean Democratic Republic. If 5% of their nuclear power were released onto Seoul and onto Tokyo, itself would bring about a victory. Whether or not they're there or not, that's really not the issue. One of the things you learn in Military Science 101 is if you go into a war with an an enemy, what will be the cost of the war? Will the war end... uh, as an economic uh, plus for you with a military victory, or will it end with a military victory and a negative economic effect on your nation, which effectively that's why you fought the war to begin with, so-called interest in the area. Now this is what this whole thing uh, is based upon. Now the Cuban crisis was a different crisis. Those uh, missiles were put in Cuba, for defensive purposes, the same thing is happening in the Korean Democratic Republic. Those are offensive or defensive, not offensive weapons. And that is what keeps the uh, Democratic uh, People's Republic in the game, so to speak, 
or they would have tried to overthrow the uh, place uh, before that, and also the proximity to uh, Seoul and the hundreds of thousands of troops that are on that DNZ. But yet, in the American press, uh, we don't hear very much about it. When we're finished here, a little bit from a face to nation, where a uh, number of reporters, including uh, Sager of the New York Times, is uh, talking about realistically what the situation is. But the importance of it, I, I think, has not dawned on the American people. We're talking about the possibility of a nuclear war. And the Chinese will not tolerate that type of adventurism on their borders, nor will the Russian uh, Federation. So you could have a wider global uh, war by quote-unquote accident, we'll call it. Whether it's deliberate or not doesn't really matter. And the effects there would be catastrophic. We came in here with Bob Schaefer, who is covered uh, storms in Texas back to Beulah in uh, 67, 50 years ago. And the hobby was uh, worse. But you have to understand that when you start talking about nuclear weapons flying in the atmosphere, not only the fallout, but into, say, Japan with the uh, types of quake zones they have there, you could set off earthquakes and all sorts of things. Uh, and you alter the patterns of the... Uh, of the climate itself, and that's one of the reasons that you had Harvey, the sea levels being altered there, I think about, what, 35 uh, or so feet above a sea level there in Houston. Although they're not directly on the coast, but they are in a very close proximity to it, and the flooding there, uh, the uh, Mia, uh has said that after Labor Day they'll start to get back in business. I'm assuming he's talking about downtown Houston, some of the areas. They're draining water off, but they also, in some areas uh, in southeast uh, Texas, they're still having some rain that has went on to Louisiana. So we just hold our uh, collective breaths. Uh, we're talking about when it bleeds, it leads. Well, Hurricane Harvey was bleeding so it led but not the supposed nuclear war but in Washington you have other machinations going on a uh, debt ceiling uh, limit that has to be extended by the end of this month they probably will have some short gap uh, scam coming up and also at the same time you have a number of other things uh, the initial uh, down payment on Harvey uh, roughly $7.5 billion at the Trump administration's request. We'll call it $8 billion, we won't quibble. But those are some of the things that are happening there, plus what they call a tax reform, and effectively all it is, is giving a tax relief to the rich. That is all it is about uh, there. So that is uh, coming up. Uh, so they have a full plate in uh, Washington. Because it is Labor Day, we'll go to, I believe we first go to E.J. Dion. Uh, there's a piece in the Post. There's also a piece uh, from uh, Dr. Larry Summers, the former president of Harvard. And uh, Mr. Simonson, I think it is uh, there, uh, out of Texas, an economist, all talking about workers, trade unions, and uh, Labor Day. So we'll go to those. We'll have uh, sports and uh, with uh, time, we'll have some of the panel discussion from uh, Face to Nation, at least a few edited uh, remarks. So let us roll on here. I think we covered basically the potential catastrophic war in a great uh, detail. One of our favorite types here, the American Mercury, will catch on to uh, Trump's uh, Quan game. And we won't read his entire article. We'll just sort of move along with it. On a holiday weekend set aside to honor the American working class, it is hard to escape the sense that American workers find themselves exploited by our politics and particularly by our president. If wage earners could uh, turn all the warm words they have heard into dollars, they would be rich. But you uh, never receive the rights or benefits 
that is supposed to come there. Uh, they have never received that. Excuse me. Decade after decade, uh, we engage in more or less arguments about economic justice. Yet over the past 15 years or so, the conditions of laboring uh, men and women has, uh, by uh, many measures, gotten worse. And we talked about that a study from the conference board on our Labor Day program. Uh, do in fact uh, tune into that one, and it was uh, featured in the Wall Street Journal. In his campaign, a DJ Trump promised the world uh, to American workers, including better and more generous health care systems. Having broken his health care pledge, he now claims he will live up uh, to his vow on uh, vows. Excuse me, plural, on uh, jobs and wages by cutting corporate uh, taxes, a trickle-down scheme. Remember all those stories in 2016 about Trump being a different uh, sort of Republican. Now it turns out he's the same old trickle-down uh, conservative, only meaner. He preys on uh, racial feelings, anti-immigrant uh, settlements. Incidentally, he's going to tra- cancel the uh, DREAM Act and leave it up to Congress, which they'll never get around to. Here's what he said last week in Missouri. We must reduce the tax rate on American business so that they can keep jobs in America, create jobs in America, and compete uh, for workers' uh, rights here in America, America we love. Now, if Trump hadn't pretended to be some sort of different uh, kind of populist hero in 2016, his recital of the old Republican boilerplate, and that is all it is, would be particularly interesting and troublesome. But it is uh, meddingly uh, to see, uh, meddingly, excuse me, to see uh, this man described as uh, some a great innovator when it comes to the interests of the left out and forgotten. Now he goes on to Robert Taft. Uh, for those that remember, Robert Taft was Mr. Republican. Among the conservatives of his day, he had a debate with Walter Roof of the UAW, the United Auto Workers Union, a man that marched with Dr. King, a legendary leader of the UAW. Anyway, prosperity uh, here depends upon a larger percentage of the proceeds of our well-being uh, invested in new tools and new investments. That's what uh, Mr. Republican Taft said. It takes about six or $7,000 to create one job at good wages today. These uh, job creators have been uh, central to the GOP uh, ideology for a long time. Rufa Reber unpersuaded. Unfortunately, he asserted that uh, most uh, everything that Congress has done in, in the past 68 months has moved in the direction of giving more uh, to the people who already have too much and taking away from people who need more. Senator Taft, Rufa said at another point, that is the uh, same kind of economic theory that we press on to Harding, Coolidge, and of course Herbert Hoover, known as Depression Hoover. Taft, to his credit, did not uh, pretend to be someone he wasn't. He believed uh, in the idea that he was pushing, but everyone who expects Trump to make American workers uh, to a new uh, place should be profoundly disappointed. As Rufa described the conservative economics, it seemed as if, uh, as as relevant today as it was 70 years ago, basically speaking. And I'll finish this up now. Walter Rufa said, there's a direct relation between the ballot box and the uh, bread box. I still think he was right. This is E.J. Dion writing in the Washington Post on the 3rd of September. Now let's back up here a bit, and we'll go to uh, Larry Summers. It's time uh, to balance the power between workers and employers, is his essay here. The central issue in American politics today is the economic security of the middle class and their sense of opportunity for their uh, children. As long as a substantial majority of Americans believe that their children will not live as well as they did, our politics remain bitter and divisive. Surely related uh, to middle class anxiety is a growing is a slow growing growth of wedges uh, even in the ninth year of economic recovery. The Phillips curve, which uh, 
people aren't familiar with, they don't talk about as much today, which postulates that tight labor markets lead uh, to acceleration in wage growth. Appears to have been broken. Unemployment's at historic low levels. The Bureau of uh, Labor Statistics reported Friday that the average hourly earnings uh, last month rose three cents. Little more than uh, one uh, tenth of a percentage bump for the past year. The uh, they rose only uh, two point five percent. In contrast, profits of the S&P 500 rose at an annual rate of 16%. 16 to 2.5. What's going on? Economists don't have a complete answer. In part, uh, they, uh, they are uh, invincible uh, year-to-year uh, fluctuations. Uh, profits have declined in uh, several recent years. And uh, in part, uh, the Bureau of Labor Statistics Data reflects wage earnings in the U.S. even though a, a bit less than half of the profits are earned abroad. Now, that's a very big uh, part of it. And when you hear uh, D.J. Trump talk about his uh, trade policies and become uh, more uh, vulnerable as the dollar has declined relative to uh, other currencies, finally, uh, wages have not risen uh, because of a strengthening uh, labor market has drawn more workers into the labor force. But I suspect the most important factor is that employers have uh, gained a bargaining power over uh, wage workers. Same thing, almost sounds like Karl Marx here. While uh, workers have lost it, technology has given uh, some employers, depending on the type of work involved, more uh, scope for replacing American workers with foreign workers. Think of outsourcing or with automation, think of uh, boarding pass uh, kiosks at airports. I've been drawing on the gig economy. Think of Uber. Well, Uber is moving to self-driving cars as fast as they can. So that leverage to hold down wages has increased. On the other hand, other factors have decreased the leverage of workers for a variety of reasons, including the reduction, uh, reduced availability of a mortgage credit the loss of uh, equity in existing homes it is harder uh, it is uh, harder than it used to be to move uh, to opportunity diminishing savings in the wake of the uh, 2008 depression he calls it crisis it means families cannot even afford a brief interruption in work closely related uh, is the observation that workers as consumers uh, appear more likely than last year to have uh, to have uh, to purchase from monopolies such as a consolidated airline circle services sector, local health providers, rather than from firms engaged in fierce price competition. That was back to Adam Smith. He used to always talk about that. On Labor Day, uh, we would do well to remember that unions have played a critical role in the American economy. More broadly, they provided uh, this is something that's recited all the time. Social Security, Medicare, all things that the Republicans would like to uh, eliminate. 6.4% of private sector workers belong uh, to a union. Astonishing uh, figure there and tells much of the story. In an era when the most uh, valuable companies are Apple's, the Amazons of the world, rather than General Motors or General Electric, the role of unions uh, cannot be cannot go back to being what it used to be. Well, this is a bit of fiction. It, it can, uh, if the demand is put, particularly with Amazon, since Amazon is a very large uh, workforce, not compared with Apple, and since it now has Whole Foods, there are thousands of workers involved there. Potential to have a million workers under the ban, including the Washington Post here. Whereas uh, Apple is a limited uh, in terms of the number of people that it employs directly. Consider the basic functions of union balancing the power of uh, the employer versus the worker. So that, we started with with that particular uh, situation. Uh, let's see let me, who we left out here. We got E.J. Dion. As far as uh, D.J. Trump with his dwindling 
space. That's another one from the Washington Post. Well, with his low 30 uh, job uh, approval rating, not something for DJ Trump to panic about because all, according to our Marley, he, model, he has to get to uh, core uh, 25. We're not talking about, incidentally, 25 uh, as a uh, approval rating. But it is uh, dropping uh, with his uh, core base, and he's been going back to that core base and what they uh, put as an assumption here, the uh, fallout from uh, the various Russian-related fiascos. And there are a bunch of those uh, put together. Charlottesville, no doubt, uh, gave a big kick as far as uh, numbers of people falling off. Now, the one... um, uh, loose kind of connection here is this so-called tax reform, how they'll be pushing the package. Actually, what they're doing is talking about reducing the uh, corporate rate uh, from what it is now to about uh, 15%. We don't know about the other uh, tax categories that he once talked about. But there would not be a substantial uh, savings there for ordinary people. It's more of the trickle-down scheme. But they would put that as a uh, how corporate media would spin it as a victory for D.J. Trump. It's a victory for the Republican Party. They've been talking about this uh, for the last uh, 20 years. And there has not been any quote-unquote tax reform since the days of Ronald Reagan. But at the same time, taxes are lowered today than they have ever been uh, in the modern history of this industrialized uh, nation. So, therefore, uh, very little uh, can be... uh, can be said about this. So what you're doing, you're setting up straw persons there. It's sort of like the coverage of Harvey. The media uh, tagged old DJ Trump as not being empathetic. Well, DJ Trump goes back. This time he actually does appear in Houston. He has little African-American kids uh, picking them up, passing out whatever swag uh, to uh, people, even autographing a wall. At a shelter. Surprised he wasn't passing out pictures of himself. No uh, America First hats. They cost $40. But he probably could have gave out one or two uh, to uh, some people in transit there. But that didn't appear just as an advertising gimmick. Only 34% of the people agree with the pardoning of uh, Sheriff Joe Apayo. While 60% uh, said he did the wrong thing. Well, Joe Apayo is one of those things that will be uh, forgotten, but when you start talking about the uh, DREAM Act, uh, uh, let's see, there are 800,000 immigrants, uh, these are children, that uh, came in illegally, but they've been around, went to college, and still working. That's what you call a business necessity thing, a different, totally different situation. Businesses are opposed to it, Little Paulie Ryan uh, urged uh, him not to rescind the program. They'll try to patch it up a little bit here, but uh, supposedly the word is that he will, uh, in fact, uh, suspend it. And at the same time, uh, trying to get the aid uh, for Harvey, maybe attach it to a debt ceiling. The numbers here, when you look at it, um, are not that impressive. 34 but lately, uh, as this article says, presidents have been a lower than they used to be. But it's just that D.J. Trump started out low. Performance uh, from, uh, let's see, Republican-leaning voters disapproved of D.J. Trump from 19% in June uh, to uh, 25% in August. But that still leaves 75% approval. And from Fox News, uh, that is higher than, uh, let's see, for Trump, since he elected to characterize the erosion of uh, negability, pointing to Fox News, finding that uh, 96% of uh, Trump voters are satisfied. That is higher than the 93% uh, of, voters, of Clinton voters who remain uh, satisfied. Mm. Well, of Trump voters, but you're talking about about 40%. From Charles Franklin, he is at the Marquette Law School uh, poll. Uh, said deterioration in his overall approval ratings 
have been a fairly typical, and this is a recent president's opening stretch in office. What's different, he said, is that Trump started out at a low point, no doubt about that, and remains at a very low point on the edge of a nuclear war that uh, you just don't win. That, in part, explains Trump's frequent travel of uh, campaign style. This is Rick Wilson. He's a strategy frequent critic. There's nothing uh, he got right except uh, the adulteration from his base. He could eat a live a baby on stage and they'd forgive. Well, yeah, that's that's nothing uh, big there. In March, he's a Democratic uh, consultant. Uh, appears to be uh, betting uh, down his base in anticipation. This is the Russian thing. Well, that may or may not uh, happen, uh, period. And I saw this as kind of interesting, the reemergence of the emergence of the backpack. I have a backpack. They've surged uh, 22%, uh, as I suppose to the carry-on rolling type things. The everyday backpack, uh, peak design, $260. Oh, boy. That's a Kickstarter-funded uh, situation here. I don't know what this backpack does. Maybe it's self-driving. Anyway, won't even get into what it does. The Razer Tactical Backpack. That's only $119 with ample room uh, for a computer, enough space uh, for a headset, a tablet, a computer book, snacks, uh, changes of clothes. Even. It holds everything. Okay, it was designed in Oxford, England. we are going to take a look at that one. But anyway, some of the things here, we'll uh, do the sports now. Mr. Rosen, a quarterback for UCLA, came back from way down. Uh, let's see if we can find him here. He's somewhere. Here we go. His team was down uh, to Texas A&M, I believe. Uh, yeah. His team was in the process of erasing the momentous uh, 44 to 10 uh, second quarter, uh, third quarter deficit. Uh, at UCLA taking uh, Texas A&M on third and five from uh, Texas A&M's <clears throat> excuse me 10 yard line. The game ended up uh, what 44 to 45 victory. But uh, when you score that many points from the third and fourth quarter, the Bruins uh, uh, were uh, trailing uh, 31 to 10 at halftime. UCLA was embarrassed at a 44 to 10 late in the third quarter. So that's that's amazing. Mr. Rosen was able to turn that around. Exciting things going on in a college ball to the um, NFL. Excuse me, the uh, to Major League Baseball. We don't do the NFL here because of the uh, boycott, um, and it doesn't appear that. Uh, Mr. Kopanek will be employed in the NFL this season. So we go on. Cleveland was in the uh, Motor City. Uh, Cleveland 11 to 1 over the Tigers. In 12, the Phillies were in uh, Florida. Phillies 3 to 1. In uh, in uh, uh, number 12, uh, Toronto was in Cannon Yard. The final outcome of that Orioles uh, 5 to 4. The Reds uh, were in uh, Pittsburgh. Sort of like a cross-state rivalry there. 3-1 to one was the score uh, Pirates over the Reds. The Rays uh, were on the south side of Chicago. White Sox 6-2. to two. The Nationals were in uh, Milwaukee. And uh, Milwaukee wins one. And they end that tight race with the Cubs. 7-2 uh, to two Brewers over the Nationals. Kansas City was in the Twin Cities. Won a close one there. 5-4 to four, the Lions score. The Royals, nine hits and three errors. You usually don't win a game doing that. And the Twins, uh, five hits and no errors. The Mets uh, were in Houston. Astros, eight to two. They are back home again from St. Petersburg. The Mets had 11 hits and one error, uh, 10 hits and one error, and the Astros, 11 hits and one error. Atlanta and the Cubs. Atlanta won the game there, five to one over the Cubbies. Hmm, Mr. Montgomery was a loser. The Angels and uh, Rangers in Texas. Rangers at uh, seven to six over oh, the California LA Angels, I guess they call. The D backs and Rockies in Denver. 
D-backs are five to one. The Cardinals and the Giants in uh, San Francisco. Cardinals are seven to three. Mr. Weber was the uh, winner. Mr. Bumgarner was a loser. Mm. The Athletics and Mariners out in Seattle, uh, ten to two. Mariners over Oakland. The Dodgers and Padres down in San Diego. Padres six to four. The Dodgers have been losing quite a few games. Mr. Wood was the uh, loser there. And finally, the Red Sox and Yankees in New York. It was all Yankees nine to two over the Red Sox. That is. Uh, where we are, we'll look at the standings up here because we, we do this. This is the Monday morning quarterback in the American League East. Uh, Boston's on top, the Yankees are three and a half back. The Orioles, uh, Baltimore, are seven games back in the uh, American League Central. Cleveland's on top, Minnesota's nine games back. Kansas City is 12 and a half games back. In the West, it's all Astros and then the uh, Angels, uh, three, 13 and 5. It's still a close uh, race for second place between the Angels and the uh, Mariners. Mariners are 14 and a half back. One game difference there. In the National League East, the uh, Nationals are on top and then the Florida Marlins at 15 games back. In the Central, the Cubbies are back on top. The uh, Brewers are three and a half games back. The Cards are six games back. Pittsburgh is ten and a half games back. Can Pittsburgh get back in it? I don't know. More doubtful than not. In the West, the Dodgers are way out front there. And then comes uh, Arizona, 13 and a half games back. The Rockies are 20 games back. So you'd think they would sort of be out of the wild card. But we'll see where that goes. So it so much uh, for Major League uh, Baseball. Uh, we'll have to, on an, at another date and another time, have the uh, college uh, ball scores. We did get UCLA in here. And, well, maybe we can get some of them in here. Let's see. We had, well, on Saturday, Stanford was at Rice, 62-7. to Stanford over Rice. South Florida over San Jose State at 42 to 22. That was on Saturday. Uh, we, whoops, excuse me. Uh, 26. Oh, let's get caught up here. Okay. Florida State and Bama. That was on 24-7. Uh, we want to get to Sunday here. So eventually. Oh, uh, let's see, where are we? Okay, Sunday the 3rd, West Virginia and Virginia Tech. Uh, Tech pulled that one out. Uh, Tech was what? Uh, number 21 on the rating. 31 uh, uh, to 24. And did we miss anyone? No, I guess we didn't. Where's the UCLA score? Hmm. Well... Somewhere uh, hidden in the whatever. The way they've set these scores up here. We gave those. Uh, yeah, I don't see it anyway. It's uh, whatever. Anyway, that'll do it for us. Happy Labor Day to everyone. We shall uh, talk to you. Incidentally, we have a numbers man program. Um, that's our macroeconomics program. Talking about the... Uh, Job creation, about 156,000, I believe. That's t- pretty typical uh, for an August uh, in the summertime. And uh, we also have uh, the Labor Day program. I uh, invite you to uh, tune in to it. And the State of Podcasting slash Internet Radio, a fairly popular program there. We did uh, the uh, past week uh, tune in to it also. Good day. The Washington Post. David Sanger is the national security correspondent for the New York Times. My namesake, Margaret Talib, over here is the <laughs> senior White House correspondent for Bloomberg. And Nancy Youssef covers national security for the Wall Street Journal. Uh, overnight, David, we had some big news. North Korea carrying out a major nuclear test, as President Trump has tweeted. Uh, was that a confirmation that it was what North Korea says it was? 
It sure sounded like a, uh, a confirmation that it was at least a big test. We don't know for sure that it was a hydrogen bomb. The North Koreans claimed about a year and a half ago that they had exploded a hydrogen bomb. We don't think they had then. But it uh, certainly looks to be four to six times bigger than anything they've done before, which is to say four to six times bigger than the bombs that took out uh, Nagasaki and Hiroshima. So uh, this was a big explosion, and if they don't have a hydrogen weapon yet, they will soon. I think Mike Morrell had it about right when he described the paucity of options here. But I also think that the Trump team tested for the first time with this. They may not fully agree that there are no military options. You hear members of the team talk about military options that they think they have. They agree they'd be horrible. They agree there'd be a lot of, uh, of blowback to it. But I'm not sure they're persuaded at this point that military is off the table. Margaret, uh, what are you hearing is happening at the White House today? The president tweeted, what's next? That's right. And the president's uh, two tweets on this subject were interesting because the first one was pretty measured. You could call it a General Kelly H.R. McMaster tweet. And the second one moved pretty quickly into how South Korea is weak and so is China. Um, But the president's at church this morning, and then he will convene a meeting with his national security leaders. And I think at that point, they'll resume these conversations that have been ongoing. I mean, this is The idea that there could be a test like this has been known and predicted all summer, uh, but to come so soon after the fire and fury comments uh, suggests it's either a test of what President Trump will do next, a test of how China will react, maybe both. So they'll go right back uh, today and huddle at the White House and discuss these options. Well, Nancy, we know that the Secretary of State's been making calls. He talked to his counterpart in South Korea. Uh, But when we talk about disconnect within the administration, you saw that earlier this week. Um, You know, at the Pentagon, the Secretary of Defense, Jim Mattis, came and seemed to be reversing a statement that the president had made uh, when the president tweeted, talking is not the answer. Then Mattis said, we're never out of diplomatic options. That's right. Who's right? And which is the strategy? Well, so far, Secretary Mattis has been right in that uh, the, after those comments were made, the White House put out a statement about a readout of a call between President Trump and the President of South Korea, President Moon, in which they talked about diplomacy as an option. Uh, the reality is that Mattis has a uh, an interest in pushing uh, diplomacy from his perspective. He's trying to protect relationships with allies, reassure them that the U.S. is there to support them, reassure um, the the West itself that there are uh, other options than what he sees as catastrophic military options. Yes, they're there, but the consequences are so big and nobody understands that more than the Secretary of Defense from the position where he sits and the military options that he's looking at on a regular basis. And yet the president tweeted this morning, uh, as you referenced there, Margaret, South Korea I've been telling them appeasement is not an option. Yeah, it's, it's very uh, confusing because at some point a priority has to be chosen. Is it the trade relationship with South Korea? We saw this week some discussion about uh, tearing up that five-year deal or dealing with the North Korean threat. That is, allies all have to be on the same page. And if we're arguing with South Korea about uh, trade, it makes it much harder to get on the same page about how to address South Korea. So th- there seems to be a, a back and forth about what the priority is in terms of uh, the administration. Uh, and we saw that in the tweets in which he referred to appeasement with South Korea, which, by the way, became a breaking news alert within the South Korean press. And that, you know, there, that's a few things that are alarming here. One is that at the very moment that we should be making sure that we're on the same page with our allies, we seem to be uh, unnecessarily and surprisingly provoking them, both on the talking about tearing up the trade deal and on the appeasement front. Um, And then to David's um, sort of scary remarks on, I understand why the administration would want North Korea to believe that military options are on the table, but they are, there are options, but they are, as you said, catastrophic and the thought of using them. Um, So if talking is not the answer, it might not be the answer alone, maybe talking with sanctions, maybe the containment, but, um, military options are a disaster. Well, we had the Treasury Secretary out this morning already saying, well, we're, we're writing another round of sanctions. What are the options, yeah. David, so, that so, you refer to? Well, there are sanctions you could go do, but we've been trying sanctions since 1953 in various <laughs> forms, uh, since uh, uh, soon after the Korean War uh, ended. So if you wanted to do sanctions that would make a difference, you'd have to go after their energy supplies. And going after their energy supplies is very hard to do And that's a China question. That's a China and a Russia question, but primarily China. And the Chinese still have not come to the conclusion 
that it is worse to have a nuclear North Korea than to collapse North Korea. So they are not likely to do anything that would lead to collapse and cutting off energy could go do that. There are cyber options. Uh, in other words, a way of trying to attack the North Koreans without it being clearly us and without causing the kind of chaos that you would from bombing from, from uh, the air or doing something similar to that. Uh, the problem is we don't think they're terribly effective. We reported that there was a cyber operation against their missile program that President Obama authorized starting in uh, 2014. Unfortunately, if it was working for a while, it's not working anymore terribly mm -hmm. effectively. And finally, there are um, options that would basically cut off all interaction with the country, intercept shipping, do the kind of embargo that the United States did against Japan prior to Pearl Harbor tried against Cuba at various moments. But that risks conflict at sea. Ruth, uh, Congress is coming back in session. I hear that. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're gearing up for that. Senator McCain will be returning to Washington, but before that he went to Italy and he made some pretty extraordinary remarks at uh, a forum. And I want to read these to you and share them with our viewers. And he pointed to sort of America's role in the world, saying many are questioning whether America is still remaining engaged in the world, upholding traditional alliances and standing up for the values we share. And this has much to do with some of the actions and statements of our president. And he gestured to the debate underway in the country right now about what kind of role America should play in the world. The future of the world will turn to a large extent on how this debate in America is resolved. What is he bringing back to Washington for President Trump? Well. You know, Senator McCain has never been exactly shy about stating his views, but now he's sadly and gravely this ill. This is not politics ending at the water edge. Uh, he, and he, I, I have to point out that he wrote a very full-throated um, op-ed for the Washington Post this week where he talked about how Congress needed to stand up to President Trump, about how he acts as if Congress is not a co-equal branch of government. So he is back and loaded for bear, and I think deeply worried, as are many members of Congress and many of his colleagues, uh, about a retrenchment in the world of the United States and a need to sort of send signals to our allies that while they may have qualms about this president, uh, he will not be president forever and that the U.S. is not going to abandon its role in the world. Margaret, that's an extraordinary message to be sharing with our allies, but Senator McCain clearly thought it was a necessary one. Yeah, I mean, I think John McCain is in full legacy slash leave nothing on the table mode right now. And he's saying the things that uh, the House Speaker and the Senate Majority Leader either don't feel that they should say or feel that they can't say strategically for reasons that have to do with party unity or midterm elections. Um, but I also think that if you asked McCain, he would say that Trump started it in terms of not leaving uh, politics at the water's edge and that, that the president uh, crossed the line in a way that previous presidents haven't. Uh, where does this all go? Politically speaking, in terms of geopolitics, look at Angela Merkel, look at the French leader, uh, look at the rest of the world leaders, uh, our Western allies increasingly open to uh, publicly expressing some of their concerns about U.S. leadership. So I'm not sure, broad strokes, what impact it has on the world. I think domestically it has an impact, and McCain's effort seems to be to embolden Republicans in Congress to speak out more forcefully, uh, even if it involves contradicting the administration. Well, the crisis most immediate at home has been Harvey. Uh, you saw the president return to the state of Texas uh, this weekend, and he said, as tough as it has been, it's been a wonderful thing to watch. <laughs> Perhaps a reference to some of the signs of unity there. Sure. Ruth, uh, how do you grade the president's response? So I think you need to grade the president on two different metrics. One is kind of technical merit. How well has the federal government working with state and local governments responded to this crisis? On the tech, and that may be the most important metric. And I would give the administration so far a good grade on that. We have not, it, it, Brownie would not have gotten in trouble for a heck of a job, uh, Brownie, if he had been, in fact, been doing a heck of a job. So, on that, some worries about what's happening with these Superfund sites, some quibbles about if these uh, proposed budget cuts had gone through, what might have happened, but technical merit, good grade. On the emotional response, let's be clear, this president is kind of empathy impaired. And so I think he wants to say 
the right thing, but the right thing doesn't come out of his mouth. So you see comments like the one you cited. He'll talk about the great turnout. He'll mm-hmm. talk. He'll use the opportunity to take a jab at the media. Um, he doesn't do um, feel your pain very well. That is not um, good for him. It's not good for the country. But I think he's trying his best on that. Does the debt ceiling increase that needs to happen get tied to this Harvey relief? I think um, in, in a strange way, the, all of the um, problems that are coalescing uh, in d- September for Congress in a very short time frame, the debt ceiling, the government funding, have been made, ironically, perhaps a little bit easier by Harvey. So some of the usual, because we're going to need billions of dollars, the administration has asked for the first tranche of that money. Um, And so the usual maneuvering about how we can't do this without offsets and things like that, and the the threats to uh, FEMA operations and other operations that would not just come from the debt ceiling, Mm -hmm. but from shutting down the government. I'm hopeful um, that that Harvey, for all the suffering it's caused, I don't want to be empathy impaired myself, is going to make what needs to happen in Washington a little bit easier. And we know the president's going to announce his decision on this deferred action that's going to impact the children of immigrants who brought their kids here illegally. That's going to be on the 5th. Does that impact, undo the goodwill that we've been talking about? It it depends both on what plan he's going to unveil and how he unveils it. Do we have indications uh, so far? We do, but uh, sort of. But uh, everyone I talk to in the White House says that this has been uh, a matter of intense debate where uh, feelings have changed and shifted uh, in terms of precisely what to do. But look, here are the parameters that we all know. Uh, There is some push uh, for congressional Republicans to take the lead on the fix. And there is the counterbalancing threat of the lawsuit, the court challenge by a group of red state uh, states attorneys general. And the president trying to find that sweet spot in the middle where he... uh, fulfills a campaign promise to crack down on illegal immigration, but shows empathy for dreamers. So what does that look like? Does the president say um, the white, the administration is not going to enforce, uh, mm-hmm. not going to uh, support, you know, defend DACA in court challenges and really wants Congress to fix it and then kind of leave it to Congress to fix it? Some version of that is what people are expecting. But as we all know with this administration, um, until it happens, it's very hard to know precisely what. The thinking, though, with DACA... Yeah. Just like you see Harvey potentially tied to debt ceiling, there's a thought that if this ends up in Congress with real action, there may be potentially room for compromise where DACA and some sort of wall effort are paired together. And that's the thing to look for next week. Oh, it's a long, that. long laundry list, and we've got through about half of it right now. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we're going to be back in a moment with some thoughts from one of our favorite Texans here at Face the Nation, Bob Schieffer, who's going to give us his impressions of Hurricane Harvey. Power to the people. The Black Panther Party may have dissolved more than 30 years ago, but you'd never know it from the looks of this gathering at an Oakland restaurant. They had reconvened briefly to celebrate the 80th birthday of one of the Black Panther's founders, Bobby Seale. Comrade Chairman Bobby Seale. He's a little rounder these days and perhaps a little slower. I did not want to be walking over like this. (laughs) Okay. But at 80, Seal hasn't lost a flicker of the fire that helped change the political landscape of the 1960s. This was all power to all the people. We was beyond just power to black people. Power to the people. Time hasn't dulled the sharpness of their swagger, the leather jackets, the berets, and the guns. For many, the Black Panthers and their defiant image remain as relevant and as controversial today as ever. Take Beyonce. When her dancers borrowed the Panthers' iconic look at last year's Super Bowl, both praise and criticism flew. It was a complete revelation, I think, to how the Panthers continue to capture the imagination. It was important to, for folks to feel what going through a newspaper was. Rene de Guzman curated the All Power of the People exhibit at the Oakland Museum. Not in my wildest dreams would I imagine a Black Panther show being a blockbuster. Perhaps that's because the Panthers have become as much pop culture as political party. Their message was branded with contemporary but often inflammatory artwork. They were the first to use the term pig to refer to the police, which to this day 
remains as offensive to police officers as the Black Panthers intended it to be. Why a pig? A pig for them was a dirty animal. It was an animal without morals, and it was also a very dangerous animal. We gotta get rid of the pig. Their approach the raised pig. eyebrows and tempers all around the country, but they were not without structure. Seal wrote a strict 10-point platform, the party's founding principles on this legal pad that somehow managed to survive all these years. This is all your handwriting. This is all my handwriting, my printing. He hasn't seen it in years, but can recite every word of it to this day. We want freedom and power to determine our own destinies. It demanded, among other things, access to better housing, education, and an end to police brutality. Do you think this is still relevant today? Every nickel of it. Grim-faced and silent, a file of angry young Negroes. The Panthers first got national attention when members marched, armed, to the floor of the California State Assembly taking advantage of the gun laws at the time that allowed a firearm to be carried openly. The armed ban forced its way past the surprise and bewildered state police. It wasn't just a stunt. Bobby Seale of Oakland read a statement protesting the killing of a young Negro. It was an extension of the Panthers' armed citizen patrols. They had been formed to monitor, some would say intimidate, police. Cops says, you can't observe me. And we recite the law. Well, you cannot remove a person's property from it without due process law. Step back, you cannot touch my weapon. It is private property. And some black dude said, he said, man, what kind of Negroes it is? <laughs> Seal was chairman of the Black Panthers, while Huey P. Newton was its minister of defense. In 1967, he was arrested for fatally shooting an Oakland police officer. Free Huey became the party's rallying cry. And after four trials, Newton's case was eventually dismissed. How much did Huey's trial really galvanize the movement? It wasn't Huey. Dr. Martin Luther King getting killed galvanized the movement. The tone of a Black Panther rally was more in your face than the often polite protests of Dr. King. Although they claimed that this was all about self-defense, they also called for revolution, a violent one if need be. You can jail a revolutionary, but you can't jail a revolutionary. Many critics saw it not as a movement, but as a criminal enterprise filled with those willing to sacrifice anything for the cause. Who does the power belong to? The black people. people. All people the poor and people. people. We knew that the system that had enslaved us could not remain in place because it was that system of capitalism on the backs of African slaves that created our state of oppression. Elaine Brown rose to become the first female chair of the Black Panther Party. For me, there was no turning back. Once you say you believe in something, you're ready to live and die for it, then that's what you do. Some did die on both sides of the struggle. When police raided a Panther headquarters in Chicago, a shootout left one of the movement's most charismatic leaders, Fred Hampton, dead. And all hell broke loose. Murder. The pigs murdered. Uh, Deputy Chairman Fred Hampton, why he lay in bed. The Panthers called it murder. Police called it self-defense. The immediate violent criminal reaction of the occupants in shooting at announced police officers emphasizes the extreme viciousness of the Black Panther Party. We were, from the beginning almost, the targets of the federal government. Uh, J. Edgar Hoover, by 1968, was saying the Black Panther Party was the greatest threat to internal security of the United States. I'm not thinking of a public announcement on this, incidentally. Hoover even brought his concerns about the Panthers to President Nixon, who could be heard on a telephone call pondering how the FBI could be used against them. On a case-by-case -case basis, you could determine that you would want the Bureau to get in. In other words, where you sort of had the scent or the smell of of a na of a of the, of the national conspiracy thing, you know the the kind of thing like the Panthers and Black all that. Panthers all these right, so Democratic right. society, something that where, where it's basically that kind of a of an action. Found the tape, baby. Smoking gun evidence that the Nixon administration, starting with Nixon himself, this dude was given directives to get rid of these Black Panthers. Now Age we, has we mellowed going, Bobby Seale's view of marrying of activism place. and guns. Case in point the Black Lives Matter movement, also born in Oakland, that is still fighting police brutality 50 years later. When kids come up and ask your advice today about guns, you tell them... You don't need guns today. The cell phone is the best piece of technology we got 
to observe cops. You can have an international cop watch program <laughs> without a gun. That's where Seal says the Panthers went wrong, letting their militant protests overshadow what he saw as their larger purpose, community service. The Panthers organized free breakfast programs for kids long before public schools in this country started doing the very same thing. There were health clinics too, food drives, voter registration drives, even an ambulance service. The purpose of the Panther programs was to provide a model, a living model for what American government should be doing. Stephen Shames documented it all as the Panther's unofficial photographer. This was in Palo Alto. I love this picture. It was the softer side of the Panthers that his photos often captured. Many never saw the light of day until he compiled them into a book for the Panthers' 50th anniversary. Panthers were parents. Panthers were lovers. You see the Panthers with their wives and girlfriends. You see the Panthers with their children. And you just see the tenderness. I think that's what didn't come out with the militant image that was in the media, marching, wearing the leather jackets, wearing the berets. The party was not just some group of thugs or social do-gooders or do-batters, if you like. We were an organization that had goals and had an agenda and had an ideology, and that shapes everything I do uh, right now and has uh, for the past 40 years. Elaine Brown continued working as a community organizer and activist long after the Black Panthers began to fray as a party back in the early 80s. She worked for prison reform then, and she still does. She recently organized this urban garden, for example, to help inmates, who she says were jailed unfairly because of their race, get a new start by selling the produce that they plant and pick. This is a continuation of what we did do in many ways. It's not exactly, but it's what I can do. A bright corner in this still impoverished section of West Oakland, where the Panthers were born. By the way, it wasn't just former Black Panthers who were at that party for Bobby Seal. There were plenty of young activists there, too, looking to an older generation for answers about race and justice and how best to affect the change that the Panthers had hoped would have come long ago. Hurricane Beulah was my first one. It slammed into the Texas coast back in 1967, before I came to CBS. It left one-sixth of my home state underwater. Harvey would be even worse. But as I watched what Harvey wrought, I was struck by just how similar those pictures were to my memories of Beulah 50 years ago. Our technology is so good now, we knew exactly when Harvey would make landfall and a lot more. But it's not the technology we remember. It's realizing the awesome power of nature. This was Beulah. This is Harvey. Somehow the big ones always turn out worse than we thought. This is me, one day into Katrina. We knew it was bad. Tonight, we are beginning to understand just how bad. In a hurricane, it's all hands on deck, whatever your job. Reporter Brandy Smith of our Houston affiliate, KHOU, was doing a live report when she saw a man trapped in a flooded truck. She flagged down a rescue boat team and led them to him. I am terrified for him, and here he comes. As she was reporting, her station was being evacuated because of high water. But it's always the most vulnerable who suffer the most. These kids got through Beulah. These will make it through Harvey. The pictures of traffic jams of Texans who didn't wait to be asked for help made me proud. They just loaded their boats on trailers and headed into the worst of it. Nor will I soon forget the pictures of these poor people in a retirement home. We can be thankful they were found. As it always is, we saw the worst bring out our best. After the awful scenes we saw just weeks ago in Charlottesville, in Texas we saw white kids and black kids just being kids. In a hurricane, it doesn't matter if you are black or white or brown or purple. Maybe we do have to be taught to hate. The statistics this storm has generated are staggering. More important are the numbers we'll never really know. All those who just showed up to help. Like Mattress Mac, the furniture dealer, 
who opened his showroom as a shelter to hundreds. Singers who sang. Oh, my soul. Barbers who showed up at shelters with their clippers. People forming human chains to rescue others from the flood. Go, 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 go. Bakers who baked. And the pizza guy who would not be deterred. And yes, that is Spider-Man. Only Texans would know all this unfolded on and around the very battlefield where Sam Houston and his ragtag army against all odds fought for and won Texas independence from Mexico. This week, their descendants met another powerful force. It's not over yet, but my money is on Texas. For Face the Nation, this is Bob Sheehan.